Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Earth Interior Leader, Julie Brigham Gret. Okay. Welcome, everyone. My name is Julie Brigham Gretti, and on behalf of Bob Anderson and myself, we're both the conveners of the session. We welcome you to the Earth Covering Neighborhood Panel on National Security and Climate Change. Naomi Klein stated in her book that, that in her book, this changes everything, that if we continue on our current path of allowing emissions to rise year after year, climate change will change everything out ar around the world. David Grinspoon, in his, in his book, The Earth in Human Hands, said, humans are possessed to some degree with some power of foresight, yet we are so often learn the hard way through disaster. So to explore national security and climate change issues, let me introduce our moderator, Andy Rifkin. Andy is a, a well-known journalist and author, covered environmental issues and disasters for the New York Times from 1995 uh, to 2016 with his blog, Dot Earth, which I was a big follower of. Many of you probably were, too. He is now director uh, of the Columbia University Earth Institute on Communication Sustainability. Please help me welcome Andy and our panelists. Andy will introduce them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And thank Bob Anderson for organizing this. Um, I've been on the climate beat now for half of my life. I'm 63, so do the math. It's a, it's a really a weird thing to have written about something for so long, especially coming to the environment from issue, covering, co coming to climate from covering issues like conventional pollution, the Hudson River, and where we fix things. You know, sewage plants were built, and laws were passed, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. Now we have this thing that emerged. It felt like an environmental problem when climate change emerged in 1988 as a big news story. But it became very clear very quickly that it's much more profound than, than that. The emergent properties of it, resources for the future, just last year published a paper saying there is no such thing as an energy transition. Basically, most of the renewables have been on top of more fossil fuels. So it doesn't have the same feel. It doesn't have the same characteristics. And the discussion today about conflict, I think, largely relates to those dimensions of the climate problem that are not simple. It's, it's not like stick a Band-Aid on it. It's all of those things. It's technology, it's law, it's adaptation, absolutely, in the face of that building pulse of greenhouse gases, and it's mitigation, or we're having a world that, you heard David Grinspoon, Grin, Grinspoon's book on the Anthropocene is a really good picture of the planetary future that is absolutely in our hands right now. So we're gonna talk about this in the context of, clim of co conflict, and this great, array of uh, expertise here from agriculture, Arctic. Solomon is, has a great uh, techno technological capacity to look at human dimensions of change and atmospheric change and come out with findings that hopefully will be uh, understood and integrated into policy. And Sherry and is dug in on that intersection of how do you get people to listen to these inconvenient data sets. Um, so we're gonna start with Sherry Goodman, who, you know, I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on, on introductions, but she's been immersed in at the uh, intersection of defense policy and security policy and climate change for a, a long time. Uh, you were Under Secretary of Defense, the first Under Secretary of Defense for environmental security, right? Yes. And is it true that threat multiplier is a, is a term that you <laughs> kind of helped to amplify? You did coin it, so we go, we do a deep Google search, it comes back to you, it's pretty great. So if you could begin with your, uh, what got you to this point of, through all that history tour, and what makes you think of, of a path to the future that isn't calamitous? And I think you have a microphone right here. I have my own microphone. Can you all hear me? Okay, all right, great to be here with you all. And thank you very much to Julie and Bob for organizing this, and Andy for leading this, and my fellow panelists, and mostly for all of you for being here uh, today. So. Uh, I started out as a security professional over 30 years ago, uh, and I was working on the Senate Armed Services Committee when all of our nuclear weapons facilities around the country that make the, weapon, the, the materials for nuclear weapons all failed for environment, safety, and health problems in the 1980s. 
and we learned how to do environment on the Armed Services Committee. Um, I was a young lawyer at the time, and so I started learning about how the environmental laws applied across the board to federal facilities, and we applied them to DOD, cleaned up some of that. There's still a lot more to go. And then a few years later, I came into the Defense Department as the Chief Environment Safety and Health Officer with everything from cleaning up Superfund sites uh, at military bases around the country to complying with air, water, and waste laws, and using the science that many of you are doing to help us make smart decisions. Okay, so that was the era of cleanup, compliance, pollution prevention, 80s and 90s, and military environmental cooperation with countries around the world, from Russia to China, uh, as we were um, recovering from the Cold War and trying to reset to a new era. Okay, fast forward 10 years, and we know that uh, the climate threat is very much upon us. I formed in 2007 the CNA Military Advisory Board, the first group of generals and admirals in the U.S. to uh, raise attention and on the national security implications of climate change. We spent a year from 2006 to 2007 meeting with scientists like Jim Hansen and others around the, we went over to England, um, and we did a study, and we, we determined that climate change is a threat multiplier for security, for instability in fragile regions of the world, and that it would have implications even here at home. We had no idea how rapid that change would continue to occur, because now we see that, uh, of course, you know all the effects from extreme weather and sea level rise and wildfires and permafrost collapse and a new Arctic that's opened in our lifetime. We didn't anticipate that uh, in the Cold War we would see geostrategic competition at the surface level within the Arctic with, with Russia, China, and the U.S. Uh, now engaged in trying to better access the resources, the navigation opportunities, and elsewhere, or that the drought, persistent drought and prolonged drought across much of Africa and the Middle East um, would leave vulnerable populations food and water insecure to the extent that they are vulnerable to terrorists and extremists who take advantage of them, weaponize water for their own purposes, or create the greatest wave of global migration since World War II. So now we know that climate change is indeed among the most serious security threats we face. It has been accounted for in varying degrees in national defense strategies and intelligence assessments since 2008. Um, it needs more attention and it needs this science to action. I see that around here somewhere. The science informing the right decisions that lead to policy, profound policy choices that mobilize our society to move to a low carbon future and to create the resilience that we need to be able to survive uh, in a changing climate. Do you, quickly, do you see any uh, I sense that, something that others here have thought about too, um, that when we think as a country about national security, are we adequately engaging how we invest money to foster security to invest into things like capacity building and vulnerability reduction in sub-Saharan Africa as part of a, what traditionally would be called a defense strategy. You know, reducing, boosting national security by having a powerful army is one thing, but is there a logic to investing directly and in, in counting for it in reducing conflict drivers as part of what we think of when we think of national security? Yes, we, ab we absolutely, in, the, in national security decision making, we need better to understand the root causes um, that climate poses to conflict around the world. And indeed, it was very interesting, just last week at the NATO summit, the Norwegian prime minister talked about integrating the root causes of climate change into security decision making. And she specifically referred to cases in Africa, to Mali and Niger. And the Europeans are very focused on those uh, on those countries because, of course, they see migration from there. They're closer to the issue. The U.S. has been um, a little more focused on, for example, building up capability to operate in a new Arctic, although I'd say that we still have a long way to go uh, in being able to have the capabilities we need to operate 
in a, in a changing Arctic. But yes, and, and it requires, you know, the solutions aren't all military. We can, and, and mostly they shouldn't be. Uh, and that's part of the conundrum and the challenge of climate change is that, you know, we, we need to change the wheels of our society, both how we behave, um, and, you know, and one of the good things about the military is if you give them an order, you could do it. You know, when we said you have to recycle on a military base, people did it. When you, we said in the 1990s, no more smoking, people did it. Okay, so um, there is a way to model the behavior and also to take the vast um, research and development that's available across our federal establishment, not only defense, but Department of Energy Labs and many others, uh, and use that as a way to help move society toward a more resilient and low carbon future. I think we could do it um, if we just harness the right levers. Great. Well, you mentioned the Arctic, which is a good transition to your neighbor here, Zach Armilla, who uh, runs something now called the Arctic Studio. And I'd love to know more about that concept. Uh, at Columbia University, I'm building a, a new initiative on communication and sustainability that includes um, getting convenings that can drive more change than what we've had so far. Arizona State has a decision theater, for example. It's another way to incorporate data into um, a decision-making process. So, and you had time um, as a civilian in the Office of Naval Intelligence looking at the Arctic. We were just talking a minute ago. I think I first wrote about Arctic insecurity in 2001 in the New York Times when a report came out of the Navy saying, naval operations in, I in an ice-free Arctic. We need to work on that. So uh, take us to the Arctic a little bit and give us a sense of where we go from here. Sure, uh, well, it's, it's not a coincidence. The microphone closed to you. Sorry, it's not a coincidence that the military was, uh, you know, looking at this a little bit earlier than, uh, at least from a security standpoint, than a lot of the others. Uh, I, I almost brought it with me, but I have a, a report produced by the Defense Advanced Projects Research Agency, DARPA, in the 1970s called Climate Change to the Year 2000, a forecast. Right. And, and looking at it uh, from a security, from a military security standpoint, uh, starting back then. Uh, was it so accurate? <laughs> it was very vague, is what it was, um, as, you, as you might expect. Uh, so you, you initially asked how we got into this, and, and that's a good uh, uh, segue to explain the naval intelligence connection. Um, I uh, started work uh, after uh, an undergraduate and graduate, first graduate school uh, background in European and Russian studies uh, at the Office of Naval Intelligence in 2007, which was uh, a major ice minimum in the Arctic and also uh, the year that the uh, Russian submarine put a little flag at the, the bottom of the North Pole and, and drew everyone's attention uh, if, to the if topic. You, if you go on YouTube, you can see Megyn Kelly on Fox News interviewing me about that flag. <laughs> yeah. Check it out. It's pretty and So we, we started getting questions about it at the time, and I, and I at the time was initially working on uh, just sort of Russian political military issues generally, uh, but gradually over the course of a few years, my portfolio as a strategic analyst shifted uh, into uh, a role that was principal analyst for the Arctic. Uh, and so full-time uh, political, military, economic forecasting uh, related to Arctic affairs. And so that's not just uh, naval issues, but also shipping and oil and gas development and fisheries and so forth and so, and so on. Um, and I did that for five years, uh, which included uh, three years managing the intelligence community's Arctic Working Group, uh, producing uh, some of the assessments and reports that, uh, that I think you were referring to uh, already. The question of where we go from here, uh, there's obviously a lot of possibilities. Working on the Arctic, though, I think um, is in, in part because of the, the changes happening in the Arctic are, are sort of almost the leading edge of a lot of the changes that we'll see globally in terms of climate change, um, that it, it provides a good window into the kind of analytic problem that we face as a national security community in trying to understand, plan for, and respond to climate change more generally. And the national security community exists to manage risk and historically, uh, you know, the military, the intelligence community, and so forth, conceived of uh, threats in terms of human actions, uh, and thus risk as a, a function of intent and capability, and engaged in a process of forecasting and planning and action to adjust 
probabilities, but to adjust the probabilities of human action uh, from potential threats. And that occurred in a, a relative, to, at least relative to now in the near future, a relatively stable physical environment. And scientific analysis in the intelligence community and, and in, in other parts of the security apparatus tended to focus on engineering uh, or on analyzing foreign engineering and technology in order to calibrate our own capabilities. Our analytic and decision-making structure was divided, and still is largely in the United States, divided into technical and non-technical branches at the highest level of organization. Um, at, at the, at the, you know, the director, directorate levels of organization within our agencies. And our individual experts also tend to be either technical or non-technical, uh, and you don't find a lot of, uh, you know, trained uh, physicists working at naval intelligence who also have a, a good grasp on macroeconomics and uh, politics and so forth, uh, nor vice versa, uh, as you might suspect. We tend to see our expertise relatively narrowly. So my suggestion here is that in, a, in particular in a world of climate change, which is uh, a world of a, a much more dynamic physical, social, psychological system, that because human decision making is, is only indirectly influenced by the actual physical environment, it, it's much more important what people think what they perceive or expect that environment to be that influences their decision making, uh, that we'll need to restructure a lot of our organizations in, within national security, as well as the individual uh, training and expertise of, of individual analysts and policy uh, officials. Uh, and in, in at least, I think, four ways. We'll need to integrate technical and non-technical analysis uh, much more, much more effectively, uh, at least more, more so than we have now, because that analysis is meant to improve the quality of decision making. And decision making in a world of climate change is itself technical and non-technical integrated, uh, whether, whether people realize it or not. Uh, it, it's an integrated, uh, because the effects of that decision making are integrated and feed back on themselves, human action, feeds back on the physical environment, which then informs what people think is possible. And of course, what people think is possible is even broader than what actually happens, right? Or what, what is likely to, to actually happen. So we need to integrate that within organizations. I also think we need to foster cross-disciplinary expertise in individuals, um, in part because as you work your way up in a hierarchy, in a bureaucratic hierarchy of government and decision making, uh, there are fewer and fewer people passing on knowledge, expertise, and assessment to the next higher level. And in the United States, our most senior officials almost all have intellectual backgrounds in law uh, or occasionally business. Certainly our elected officials are almost all, uh, or, or not almost all, but, but more than half uh, lawyers uh, by, by training and intellectual background. Uh, I, I want to caution, however, that I don't think that, that, I think we need to avoid that turning that cross-disciplinary expertise into non-disciplinary expertise. There's, there's a tendency uh, to uh, give up on methodological rigor on, in one or more of the areas that we integrate, when we integrate, for example, academic programs um, and, and trying to maintain that level of rigor would be that, beneficial. That sounds like um, in arguments and discussions I've heard about resilience, um, having metrics for what that, how do you, what do you measure? Right, yeah, to certainly. To track that. It's easier to measure emissions of CO2 than it is to measure capacity to absorb a hurricane and come out the other end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the third uh, would be long-term thinking. It's obviously very easy to, to say. We all, of course, we need more long-term thinking. That's, people say that a lot, um, and then they end up caught up in the daily crises. Uh, but uh, I, I think that it, in a world of climate change, that long-term thinking becomes sort of even more essential, uh, and uh, especially in terms of integrating with, with technical and scientific analysis. Um, and fourth, uh, I, I think that there's a great benefit to be had from uh, more carefully distinguishing uh, value judgment from 
uh, forecast or factual est estimates and, and factual assessment, uh, in part because climate change uh, remains a politically contentious issue. Uh, one of the nice things about working in the intelligence uh, world was never having to make a, a policy recommendation. Uh, you know, and, and, and in fact, uh, being able to savor not having to incorporate value judgments into my assessments. Um, and thus, as the military is, is relatively good at, uh, just focusing on what's likely rather than, and, and letting others decide uh, what's best. Um, but the credibility of that analysis uh, and the credibility of those forecasts and estimates uh, was, would, would be undermined, I think, by too intimately weaving in value judgments. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people sh sort of shut off uh, when they hear a value judgment they don't like, but by making analysis more modular, uh, it would be possible to create more uh, influence uh, for factual assessment, which I, I think would be a fine place to start. That, that's a rich de description of the, the uh, situation we find ourselves in. At Columbia, there's this uh, difficult conversations laboratory. Uh, Peter Coleman has this lab there, and it's designed to sort of disintegrate conflict and find where's the values chunk, where's the data chunk, what are your interests, and what do you do next? And actually, journalism are, is trying to learn from that in terms of how we untangle things. So Solomon, are, are you on the technical side of what he laid out in the sense you're, you're, you have these tools for modeling at Berkeley that are powerful presenting sort of scenarios and doing a little attribution. So when you think of what you've just heard so far, and just describe a little bit of how you came to this juncture of the human system and the Earth system and where we go from here to have 100 years forward that are maybe a little less turbulent than the 100 years so far. Okay, uh, that's uh, so. Just sort of listening to this, I'm sort of wondering. I'm hoping that I'm on the uh, multidisciplinary side and not on the sort of undisciplined side. <laughs> uh, you know, we got started. Actually, I, my advisor Mark Kane, who's somewhere here uh, today, I just saw him, uh, had advised me when I was at Columbia at the interdisciplinary PhD program at the Earth Institute and, and SIPA at the School of International and Public Affairs. He said, "Read this book by Mike Davis about uh, you know these." Victorian, late Victorian famines that were occurring due to El Nino. And as I was reading this sort of anthropological book, I thought, oh, there's conflicts and famines and mass migrations, and this should be showing up in the data if it's real. And at the time, I was being trained in econometrics and causal inference. How do we learn to disentangle cause and effect uh, in economic systems when you have an economic policy? And so you can think of a change in the climate as something that's like a change in economic policy. It's just unintentional. It's just imposed on society externally, perhaps, at a moment in time. So we started looking at, you know, when El Nino occurs, those countries in the tropical belt that are teleconnected, what happens in those regions? And it turns out that during El Ninos, uh, the rate at which civil conflicts are generated, it's kind of like, you can think of it as a, some sort of Poisson process, appears to double, right? So the rate of new conflicts goes from like 3% to 6% as you shift from La Nina years to El Nino years. And that gave rise to us thinking about this problem, Mark Kane and others. Actually, I remember meeting up uh, with my longtime co-author and friend, Marshall Burke, I think at the 2011 AGU conference for the first time, and we were both thinking about this problem a lot, and we started digging into the literature. We found there were actually lots of people who had somehow found connections between sort of the climate and security or violence um, at the sort of individual level, people studying the effects of weather and temperature on crime rates, as well as people in psychology studying the effects of temperature on individual level decision making, or putting police rookies sort of in a training situation and then changing the temperature to see how their decision making changes. Uh, and then even in the archeological and paleoclimate literature, there's people that were hooking up, pointing out that mega droughts were occurring at the same time that like sort of Mayan civilizations were collapsing, for example, as just an example. And so we put all that together and started realizing that actually there's some overarching themes here. And so since then, there's been a lot more work on it, and things have been replicated a gazillion times. And I think there's a very strong empirical foundation now to understand that as climate shifts towards more extreme temperatures, particularly hot temperatures, 
and extreme rainfall patterns seem to be associated with increased violence at sort of all scales of social organization. Now that's just sort of an empirical fact. And since we sort of pulled that out of the data, there's been a lot of work to try and understand why that's true. So the analogy I often give is to say, well, that's like, you know, in the beginning we could tell that smoking caused lung cancer, just looking at raw data, but we couldn't tell you why. Since then, people have really been digging in, trying to understand what's going on under the hood. Why is it that when the environment gets hotter, we see more violence? It seems sort of almost nonsensical in some ways, but maybe too intuitive in other ways. And so, you know, since then, there's sort of really four hypotheses that are floating around, and they're not all equally well supported. So, you know, the, the sort of predominant theory that people talk about is how the climate affects economies, it affects agriculture, it causes people to change decisions about what sector to work in, it makes working in sort of what we call like a violent sector more appealing, like if my farm is not doing so well and someone comes through and they're recruiting people to go join the local insurrection, that seems relatively more appealing uh, if the farm's not doing great in that particular year. There's a fair amount of evidence for that, but it's not always explaining what's going on. There's some discussion of ideas like logistics matter, so the ice breaking up should matter. There's actually not much historical evidence of that, but you know, in the future we may start seeing things. There's also this idea that changes in the climate affect government's ability to govern. So for example, we see on hot days, uh, there are more car accident deaths. People make mistakes while driving, they speed more, but there's also fewer cops out pulling people over, right? Because it's hot and who wants to be outside doing that? So you see at the same time that we need more governance, we actually have the government pulling back and doing less work. And so there's a question of whether that might be contributing to you know, what we see going on in the data. And then the last theory, which I think is in some ways the most challenging, but I think there's a lot of new research and a lot of our work has been focusing on this, is the extent to which changes in the climate actually affect human decision making in a way that might produce more violence. And so, just as an example, some of the lines of evidence, and they're sort of starting to accumulate, we see people, there's a lot more crime at sort of an individual level. There's a lot more sexual assault on hot days or hot weeks, lots more, much more domestic violence. And in fact, a sequence of new studies indicate there's much more self-harm. So people actually hurting themselves, for example, successfully committing suicide during hot months. And so that suggests there's something very deep going on in how people make these violent decisions. And we actually recently did a lab study where we put uh, several thousand students in a lab and had them play games, economic games with one another and we changed the temperature to see how it affects their decision making. And quite remarkably, the, the most striking result is that individual students seem very excited to destroy one another's assets, like their other winnings that they've accumulated through the games when subject to the hot treatment. Um, now, that was a little disturbing, but seemed consistent with these various findings. It turned out, this, this study, we were doing two parallel versions of it. One was at Berkeley, one was in Nairobi, Kenya. And it turned out there was actually none of this signal in Berkeley. Okay, the Berkeley students are just super chill all the time. Uh, but in Kenya, our experiment, we had lined it up several years in advance, and, and it actually was being executed right as the election was being stolen by the incumbent. And there were riots in the streets. We actually had to stop data collection because the university was shut down due to violence in the streets. And so what we ended up seeing in the lab when we looked at our data and the, and the studies kept coming in is that it was actually the sort of minority group that had been, had basically had the election stolen from them that was very frustrated and was intentionally destroying the assets of the other players in the game. So we think this is the first evidence that we have sort of uh, clear evidence of the intersection of sort of climate affecting human decision making at the interface with the political system in a way where when people feel disenfranchised, they, their impulsivity to respond to that restriction is somehow now affected by the environment in which they're embedded. Okay, so I'll pass it on. But that's, that's kind of where research is today. Did, did you also do cooler? Like, did some, of the, did some of the gamification go in the cool direction? We did not have that much money. Oh, that sounds like there's an opportunity there. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so Rod, Schoonover, you've been at this intersection of physics and climate and security for a while um, with a pretty a dramatic moment um, when you kind of got fed up with the impacts of having a shift in the administration that didn't seem to take seriously the questions that arise in this changing climate and 
super-driven world. Uh, can you give us a sense, also building a little bit on what you've heard so far, yeah. of uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, well, let me uh, just, um, first of all, thanks for everyone uh, for coming during the, uh, the lunch hour. Um, so I'm Rod Schoonover. I was most recently uh, finished a 10-year career in the US intelligence community in the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research with a two-year detail at the National Intelligence Council located over at CIA headquarters. And so this is the, the actual intelligence community of the United States. Uh, before that, uh, I was a college professor. I'm, a, I'm a, trained as a complex system systems physicist, uh, and I used to come to conferences like this. Um, and I became a little bit uh, concerned about the state of science in government in the 2000s. And so around 2008, I applied for a fellowship in the, uh, through AAAS, and then I became a member of the US State Department in 2009. And of all places, I landed in the intelligence community uh, during my placement, which is a rather unusual, uh, certainly not where I thought I was going. And my job, I was a senior analyst and senior scientist for, the, as I said, the Bureau of Intelligence. Um, the things that I would try to bring into the national security discussion uh, are represented by a lot of the posters and talks in this uh, um, conference. So it wasn't just climate change, although that was increasingly important, but also water security and food security, biodiversity loss, uh, Arctic uh, issues, uh, fishery science. And so uh, my job was to really look at the primary literature, go to conferences like this, at the same time as reading fairly uh, dramatic intelligence reporting from uh, one of the biggest databases on the planet, and to fuse those into some kind of national security um, flavor. And my job was to analyze and um, assess environmental and ecological security issues for the uh, senior most members of the, uh, of the government. And so over time, I, uh, so before I go on, just thank everyone for all the academic work. Uh, the intelligence community does not ever tell you that we're using it, but we were using it. Uh, and so, um, so I think it's really important, um, a lot of it has been hit already, but what do we mean by climate change and national security or environment and national security? A lot of it has been hit on. Uh, but just to give you an overview, we're, we're talking about conflict, uh, violence oftentimes, but we're also talking about disputes over resources like land and, and water and fish. We're also talking about uh, geopolitical tensions uh, over boundaries in which those resources may be constrained. We're talking about emergent geostrategic domains like the Arctic or maybe uh, the South China Sea. We're talking about threats to global institutions on which the United States and its partners or whichever country's national security we're talking about, uh, which institutions we rely on. For example, the global food supply chain. Uh, looking at the vulnerability of global food supply to uh, a multiplicity of stresses. And that brings me really in uh, disruptive human migration. There, I, I could just keep going on infectious diseases. Uh, a lot fit into this basket of, of national security concerns. One of the things I think is difficult to convey and probably understand and certainly I had a challenge in, in conveying this to my uh, principals, is really how do you talk about multidimensional stress? Because again, as I walk through the posters and, the, and listen to 
uh, discussions, you know, you can look at this particular uh, soil stress, you can look at this particular stress on fisheries, and they don't come unidimensionally to, to societies, they come in multiples. And how do, we, how do we describe it, how do we measure it? I think most people know that it's important, uh, but it's really hard to get at scientifically. And, and so there's a lot of attention on extreme events, which is really important to understand, both in the meteorological sense and in the ecological sense, but also the aggregate sum of stresses that may not be considered extreme. Uh, and so that's something that I've been trying to tackle and understand. Part of the uh, job of the intelligence community is to provide strategic warning. Uh, you know, I think a lot more effort needs to go into that kind of work. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, John Foley, uh, so you're kind of really dug in on solutions, 100 of them at least. Uh, you had been at the University of Minnesota working on agriculture and climate for a long time, building a really communicative presence as well, and now you're at Product Project Drawdown. Uh, we've been talking off and on about the sort of the opportunity for a parallel thing, like 100 ways to build up resilience while we draw down CO2, but can you um, give a sense, of, sort of a reaction here too, and, and a sense of thinking about this in a drawdown solution space. Uh, what can be done in the next 10, 15 years that can turn the tide on some of these things? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on this panel. It's a fascinating group, and to come back to AGU. Um, I, I spent about 20 years in my life as a climate scientist and came to AGU very, very frequently, and then kind of stepped away from that for a little while, now coming back fr from a different angle, more in solutions. Um, but what's really interesting is if you think about the work done by the AGU community uh, to understand the changing like, physical climate system, our biogeochemical cycles, our global ecosystems, all the wonderful things that are presented in this area, what we kept on finding again and again and again, especially listening to these other panelists, is the changes in the physical and biological and chemical state of our planet moving away from what it had been for thousands of years to what it's moving to. Gee, uh, when we change the planet, guess what? We find again and again and again that there are these so-called you know, threat multipliers, things that translated to increased harm to society in one form or another, uh, whether it's changing food security or water security, infectious disease, the risk of conflict and violence. All these things seem, you know, bottom line, when the planet gets worse, things get worse for us. You know, okay, that's not too surprising, but it's very, very uh, sad, and it's uh, obviously a very strong motivator to address the underlying issue. Also, now I work on the other side of the street now, which is like, what do we need to do to actually solve or address climate change? And so I work for this weird organization called Project Drawdown, which is not a university, it's a little uh, nonprofit. Uh, before I joined it, I can't take any credit for this, um, they wrote a book called just Drawdown, the idea of you know, how can we actually solve it? Do we have enough solutions to address climate change? What would it take? How big are the solutions? What would it cost? And this book analyzed about 100 of them, quantifying the size of different climate solutions and their potential cost. So that's great. Interestingly, it was never published in an academic journal. It were, instead, we wrote a coffee table book, and that's why it sold really well. Um, so anyway. Um, now we're doing this second generation of Drawdown where we're going back and doing all the same research again uh, in much more depth. And in fact, in February, we'll be releasing a whole new electronic book called Drawdown Review, which we'll do every year, which will outline about 150 different solutions to climate change. Now, the, just like we saw when we look at the climate problem, when the Earth, you know, when the planet gets warmer, we degrade other systems, things get worse for people. I want to see if the reverse is true. That is, when we start to deploy climate solutions in the electricity sector, in the food and agriculture land use sector, in industry, in buildings, in transport, or by maintaining sinks on land, ocean technology, or by empowering people, all of these things, whether there are co-benefits beyond just addressing the atmosphere's CO2 levels to society as well. And it turns out there are numerous co-benefits, some of which while we have threat multipliers in the climate problem, we might have threat minimizers or threat, I hate to say dividers, that's not the right word, threat mitigators maybe as a co-benefit of some of the climate solutions. So let me walk you through how we think about climate solutions just a little bit, just to see if this makes any sense. There are three rules to solve climate change. One, reduce emissions, rule number one. 
Second rule, maintain and enhance the sinks nature's already providing. And third, and very importantly, is empower people in ways that address climate change too. You have to do all three. And reducing emissions, turns out there are five big places, 90% of our emissions come from only five parts of the economy. Making electricity is a quarter, food and agriculture is about a quarter, industry, transport, and buildings. Those five things are 90% of our emissions. It turns out that, yes, switching to renewable energy sources may have security benefits by relying less on you know, petroleum, natural gas, things that have infrastructure issues, or electrical grids like we have here in California that have been linked to wildfire, while not an international security issue. It sure as hell is a security issue if you live around here, and I do. Um, so that's kind of an interesting point. Uh, similarly, in agriculture, you know, farming in ways that reduce emissions may also sometimes make agriculture more resilient to climate shocks. We hear a lot more about like organic methods, regenerative agriculture, things that build up soil carbon, which allows the soil to hold moisture during droughts a little bit better and prevent floods a little bit better. So there's a nice co-benefit as well. And you go on and on and on. So we're trying to identify not only what are the solutions to climate change, but what are the ones that give us an additional economic benefit, human well-being benefit, human health benefit, jobs benefit, and security benefits. So, and guess what? There are some. That's really pretty interesting. On maintaining sinks, similarly we find this as well, like uh, protecting forest, helping indigenous communities protect their land may have obviously carbon sink benefits, but it may also have some security benefits or at least local well-being benefits. Similarly with restoring things like coastal wetlands and mangroves, huge carbon sinks, the blue carbon part of the earth system. Uh, those also help, and Andy's alluded to, also in climate adaptation, like hey, if we restore mangroves, we tuck away carbon, but we also make that area less vulnerable to the next big storm, which is an immediate human benefit, but maybe a longer-term security benefit as well. And then finally, the third category we focus on a lot is, it turns out there are a lot of things we should do for civilization because they're just the right thing to do. You don't do them for climate change, but some of those things we should do anyway to be a more just society turn out to have climate benefits, like protecting indigenous people's land tenure, makes forest richer and store more carbon, it turns out, but also it helps those people, which is really important. Or also educating girls and universal access to family planning. You should do those anyway, not for climate change, but when those happen, they do in fact address a major climate change lever. So bottom line of our work right now, again, is we recognize the climate problem is linked to security. I think we can also look in the mirror and see, hey, climate solutions can be linked to security as well, but maybe in a more positive direction to get these kind of knock-on positive effects, just like we saw the knock-on negative effects in the other direction. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to withhold my questions so we have time for the audience. Uh, we have about 15 minutes or so left. The one thing I am going to ask is uh, the Arctic, What's the, what are the misperceptions that people have that might have them too worried about climate change? Uh, and I don't know what, whether the truth is, but I've been to Iceland where there was a recent burst of media coverage about a glacier memorial, a plaque. It was very plaintive and powerful statement by some scientists and others. Uh, but at the same time, I've been to the Arctic Circle uh, meetings in Iceland, which are basically a big business party. They're dancing girls and Everywhere I've been in the Arctic, when you get behind the surface of woe is me stuff, it's mostly about opportunity. And the history in the Arctic, Lawson Brigham has written about, you know, it's a place that's actually well set up for peace. There, there are agreements and the like. Are, 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 we, are there any aspects of this that you all just quickly down the line feel are over interpreted or over caricatured and when we think about climate change? Well, I, th I think we, in the Arctic, we underestimate the risks that are rising as the sea ice is retreating. Um, there's often a sense that we can take advantage of these business or other opportunities to extract the energy or develop the tourism um, or increase the shipping. And while all that is true, the risks uh, in a changing Arctic actually increase. The likelihood of the need for a search or rescue mission an oil spill. I think Exxon Valdez was all in U.S. waters and was not in the Arctic at all. Okay, think about an oil spill in Arctic waters. We don't have good technology for cleaning it up, and it probably wouldn't be, it would probably be a transboundary, a multi-nation effort um, with a lot of uncertainties. Or take one that we did at a 
National Academy of Sciences Arctic Futures 2050 just a few months ago um, with the Wilson Center, Center for Climate Security and Sandia Labs looking at a potential nuclear shipping incident in the Bering Strait in 2050 where a Russian nuclear powered icebreaker collides with its Chinese escorted liquid natural gas vessel uh, in the Bering Strait where the US and Russia are only 30 miles apart. What would we, and, and we know the history, what keeps me up at night is that Russia's nuclear history is very checkered. They don't report well, they've had numerous accidents, and they tend to cover up when something bad happens. And they just launched a floating power plant to supply their offshore oil industry with electricity. Yes. Any other quick thoughts, or we'll go to the audience. Yeah, I, uh, I think that climate change increases the discontinuities between what people think is possible and what's actually possible. And sometimes that distortion is on the side of reality and sometimes it's on the, the, the distortions on the side of people's perceptions and expectations and, and what people uh, try to speak into existence as perhaps the Arctic Circle uh, may be an, an example. Um, well, that or short termism, short termism and yeah, status quo uh, bias. Or, 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 or what people think that that discourse can achieve mm -hmm. for their local communities and, and that, that hope is not necessarily unreasonable. Um, although, and then that can also go in the opposite direction uh, in terms of speaking threats into existence that perhaps wouldn't otherwise have, have uh, occurred because people uh, worry about possibilities that otherwise wouldn't naturally uh, take place. Um, and and the, 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 with respect to, to where are some of those discontinuities, one of them is uh, in terms of the, the global economic influence of change in the Arctic. And I'd, I'd certainly uh, agree that um, there, there are increased risks with accessibility, that it becomes a riskier place in a lot of ways to operate um, commercially. Uh, but just to, to, I mean, to think Arctic shipping and, and trans shipping, that's been talked about for, you know, in, in Western societies for 150 years. Uh, and every 10 to 15 years in the United States and Canada, there's a burst of scholarship trying to analyze, well, now it's finally the time for Arctic shipping. And it just, it, it, it's not yet. Okay, so I'm gonna rely on the microphone people because I can't really see you all. Um, raise your hand and could you take two questions and like little packets of two and identify yourself? Hi, I'm Ron Amundsen from uh, UC Berkeley. My question is maybe to Rod or Sherry. Is, does natural science, are scientists doing uh, national security relevant science well enough now? Or do you, do you have recommendations for how it could be done better that would be more informative to national security uh, related uh, uh, people like yourselves? So hold on to that question and get another one. No more questions. There can't be more questions. Over there. Believe me, I have more. Uh, I'm Abe Jacobson, and I'm from the University of Washington. And my question is, <clears throat> how resilient is Europe and North America against 10 million, 100 million, or a billion environmental refugees uh, in the coming half century. And can you relate that to how well they've done with one million Syrian refugees <laughs> in the last several years? So those are two uh, questions for the panel. One on is, is academia and science generally doing a good enough job providing the information you need? And uh, migratory pressures, um, how much of that's yeah. established? And, and can we deal with that? Well, I won't wisely jump on the first question. Uh, so, um, so, I, I, so is academic science uh, framed in a way that national security professionals can take it? Largely, yes. Um, you know, a lot of the work that, as I said before, is done in fora like this um, does have relevance, but only if there are people in the government who can translate it, right? The translation function is weak. Uh, when I left government, uh, I was told it was a, a, a giant 
blow into uh, the expertise in some parts of the government. Um, the, so the, the translation function, both within government and outside of government, is probably not where it, it should be. Now, I would also say uh, from a prior panel, work on transdisciplinary uh, problems, you know, the socio-ecological socio framework of, you know, how do you bring in humans and the uh, ecological disruption that, that's ongoing, uh, not just necessarily in the security context, because uh, that's something that the national security community does pretty well, but a, a focus on social stress, I think, is something that could be uh, uh, pursued a little bit more. Uh, we have 10 more minutes, okay. so keep uh, responses great. brief and then we can. All right. Um, Ron, great, great question. I mean, I've spent my life as a translator, you know, translating science and engineering into policy and national security decision making. Um, and there are many more people who can and should, you know, who should be doing this. I've argued that we should have um, climate and other scientists uh, co-located at our combatant commands. Uh, and in fact, at, at Pacific Command, we actually now have the first NOAA liaison officer who is uh, a scientist, but we should have them at all our commands. Air Force Weather is hiring its first climate scientist, Air Force Meteorology. So, and that, those are important first steps. But also, scientists also would do well to uh, understand how science moves through the continuum of bench and lab scale science into um, test and evaluation, demonstration, and into actual deployment. Because we often hit a valley of death where there's good science that can't get quite translated uh, into technology. And migration, my quick answer on that important, very important question is, um, my parents are Holocaust refugees, and so I'm here benefit of, of the opportunities that, you know, our nation gave to some, not enough people to, um, you know, change their nationality and have a whole new life. We can do that. We have many places, many communities in the U.S. and other places where we've welcomed uh, those who need to migrate. And as we're going to live in a planet where more people are going to need to migrate, move to higher ground, move to new places, that is, a, it's a policy decision. It's not that it can't happen, but it has to be done um, smart, you know, it has to be done smartly and with humanity, which unfortunately we haven't seen enough of in recent years. Let's, let's get another question or two if we have them. I see one at least. Uh, Frank Schwang, it seems like the remaining skeptics to climate are in political office. I is it easier to convince them that there's a military threat that, that, to help them convince that the climate change is real? Does this help make the case or not? I, I wrote about this when I was at ProPublica in the early days of the administration, and I think Rod was someone I oh. talked to at that point, but I can't confirm that. Um, so, so the question is really, if you put a national security flavor on a biophysical uh, ecological trend, does it make it more palatable to government, uh, to government officials and elected officials? Uh, I think the answer is unfortunately yes. Um, should it be that way? No. Uh, but this is the way that we have, um, our society has, uh, has moved. I actually think that this is one of the reasons why our national security, uh, just like infrastructure and social systems that we built in the 20th century, are no longer uh, all that viable in the 21st century. I would say the same thing about our national security formalism. Uh, it, it, it seems outdated. It, it, we shouldn't have to connect climate change effects to what used to be 20th century ideas of, of, uh, of national security. We should be able to say, this is a threat to the ecosystem that supports humanity and be done with it. Uh, I was in government when uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services report came out in uh, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, and it's probably one of the most shocking reports I've ever read uh, from the scientific community. Uh, but it gets no traction within the, uh, within the national security community because it's not set up 
to understand what it's saying. It just, there's just too much uh, um, overtalk. And so, um, so that, that's my own thought. I would also say that uh, there is a element of misinformation and disinformation that has to be uh, you know, factored into that question as well. I'm going to ask you all to amplify on this a little bit. Um, we also have another feature of the planet that's in rapid change, which is the information environment. The way we assess things, well, the CIA used satellites to check Soviet agriculture in the 70s and 60s, I think. But um, now we have unbelievable ability to cross-check everything, to move information instantly around the world. How does that play in as an opportunity to build a safer relationship with climate and with each other going forward in your, in your calculation. Obviously, it works in both directions. It's divisive and polarizing, but it's also it's got an incredible potential. The one example I think about all the time, West Virginia University with a $100,000 grant revealed Volkswagen's fraud, a multi-zillion dollar impact on, and on something that was killing people, uh, excess emissions from diesel uh, vehicles. And that's just a tiny, tiny glimpse of what academia and science can do with information flipping things forward. Um, so do you feel excited or terrified by the information environment's role in where we go from here? And we're toward the end here, so just let's cap this with some of your key thinking. Solomon, you want to? I, I would just say that, um, I would just say that uh, the information transformation is changing government in some very clear ways, in some conspicuous ways, thinking about security, but it has incredible opportunity, right? We don't know how many refugees there are in the world. We don't know where large populations are. We don't know, you know, who's most in need. And when you see things like people moving around, when you see violence, you should think of that as the canary in the coal mine. It's a symptom of people desperately in need of something. And so we should be using these information technologies and we will be able to very soon, as long as people are focused on the right problems, um, get the resources to these people at the moments they need them, at critical moments. Uh, and so I'm incredibly hopeful. I think it's gonna transform government in the next 30 years. Well, also that these kinds of tools are being available more to uh, non kind of intelligence actors too, that in the private sector, like uh, Planet Labs, which a lot of people know about here in San Francisco, has these you know, constellation of micro satellites. Um, it's not up to you know what the Defense Department has, of course, but the fact that you can track like um, the state, the, uh, commodity traders and uh, Wall Street speculators use this data by counting the cars in Walmart parking lots in America on a daily basis as a leading indicator of how people are feeling about the economy. That's weird, but it's really cool. And you know, it's like, oh, I think it's kind of weird, but anyway. Uh, so we can kind of get a much more, I mean, it's very interesting, it's not just you know DARPA or DIA or CIA or whoever has access to these kinds of tools. It's like regular folks and businesses and scientists now do. So that might change the dynamic of how we can use the information revolution to really uh, unveil what really is happening uh, in many different dimensions. Could be exciting. And any last thoughts from the rest of you? I, I think that the use of that information in part relies on uh, the kind of people, to go back to that last question, the kind of people who can recognize uh, valid and, and expert-based derivations from uh, the, what might be the more ideological positions. And, and just anecdotally, you know, the, uh, the military uh, is, is full of, the uniformed military is full of people who have degrees in engineering and, and in the sciences, especially in the Navy and Air Force. And uh, those folks, uh, you know, get, get this pretty well. Uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, if you talk about effects of, of climate change, you know, that's, that's relatively intuitive and they can recognize that expertise. Um, and I think that's, that's what turns whether the information bulk uh, becomes a problem or not. So, Sherry, are you ter terrified or excited about that aspect of it? Well, I, I usually style myself as an optimist, but since we had all these optimistic answers <laughs> here, I have to give you the other side, which is I think that um, the, the uh, ability of disinformation to disrupt our elections and era in which we live now and our whole democratic process is extremely re real, is going to continue. And I think without campaign finance reform, money continues to talk. And that's why, uh, in part, even though the, you know, the, the national security implications of climate change might have been able to break a political impasse, you, you had other forces, which is basically fossil fuel money in politics, that continues. Um, uh, and that is, a very, that is ultimately a very powerful force. 
So there you go. And that means this is a systems problem to the max. The, the word super wicked. Uh, Kelly Levin, who's now at World Resources Institute, called climate change a super wicked problem, getting at the old wicked complexity and taking it to another level. And that means if you're not thinking about politics, you're not thinking about uh, family planning in Nigeria, you're not really thinking about the full climate problem. So thank you all for this illuminating discussion, and I'll keep it going on, online somehow. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Julie. Thank you, everyone. And th help me thank the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to our panel. Their conversation continues in the networking area of Centennial Central. That's right over that blue wall to your left-hand side. Our next session will begin right here at the Inspire stage at 1.40. Thank you.